The Fibber McGee and Molly Show. Each weekday at this time, NBC brings you the Fibber McGee and Molly program, transcribed, written by Phil Leslie, and directed by Max Hutto. Fibber and Molly will be with you in a minute. Within the next 20 seconds, a fire will break out somewhere in the United States. Lives may be lost, property damaged, homes or buildings destroyed. Yes, there are 4,600 fires in America each day of the year. They kill 11,000 persons and disfigure or severely burn thousands more. Ninety percent of all fires which start in the home can be traced to human carelessness. By obeying a few simple rules of fire prevention from now on, you and I can protect ourselves and our families from this devastating menace. Rule one is don't smoke in bed or discard lighted cigarettes carelessly. Rule two, clean out old newspapers, magazines, and other inflammable debris. Rule three, promptly repair defective wiring equipment. Replace worn or frayed wiring as soon as you notice it. Fire won't wait till tomorrow. Rule four, use only those cleaning fluids which will not burn. And last but not least, be careful with matches. Keep them out of the reach of small children. Remember, it doesn't pay to gamble with fire. The odds are against you every time. <laughs> big talk around 79 West Vista this week is about the speech that Mr. McGee is going to deliver tomorrow at the very exclusive Executives Club luncheon. He just finished a telephone conversation at the moment, and his wife says, Who was that on the phone, McGee? He sounded like a very important man. He is, kiddo. That was Mr. Willoughby, the president of the SAPs. The SAPs? Mm Mm-hmm. The Society for the Advancement of Purchases in the Stores. It's a businessmen's organization. Oh, He's the guy that's going to sit next to me at the Executive Club luncheon tomorrow and introduce me to all them rich millionaires that I'm the guest speaker of before. Somebody better introduce you. You'll certainly be a total stranger in that crowd. Willoughby, eh? Is that the Mr. Willoughby, the one who owns the transit system, the airline, and all the real estate west of 14th Street? That's him, Tootsie. You wanted to know what I was going to talk about. Did you tell him about three hours? Why do you keep saying that? This speech isn't so long. It just seems that way. Oh, I told Willoughby to be sure the fried chicken is crisp and not to seat me next to any members of the city council. Why not? Oh, you know how long it takes them guys to do anything. Before you can get them to pass the peas, it has to be seconded and put to a standing vote. You know, I'd love to be there tomorrow, dearie. When you stand up and all those millionaires applaud... Oh, I almost forgot what else Willoughby called me for. What? Well, he's going to introduce me, of course, and he points out that he doesn't know very much about me. The wise move on your part. He says he wants to give me a big build-up, naturally, so if I don't mind, he'd like to see a little background on me. You know, the kind of stuff. Education, college degrees, war record, business connections, interesting experiences, and all stuff like that there. Poses a problem, doesn't it? Oh, I don't know. I'll dig up a few fascinating facts about myself for him. I may not be any millionaire. May not be. But I've had a pretty interesting life, kiddo, so far. I wonder how many of them big shots were ever in vaudeville with Fred Nittany, for instance. A good point. Maybe you ought to come on uh, juggling a few water glasses and wearing a couple of uh, small American flags stuck in your ears, because that would certainly get you the applause. Oh, no, Molly, this is serious. I'll look through my stuff and I'll... (laughs) You hear that parakeet? He's even interested in my speech. Ain't you, Buster? (laughs) That's right, baby. You just speak right up. Isn't he sweet, McGee? I'm so glad we got that little bird. Come in. Hello there, kids. Where is it? Where is it? Can I see it? Where is it? Where is it? What do you mean? What do you mean, where is it? Doc Gamble says you had a new addition to the family last week, and I run all the way over here to see it. I would have brought a present, but I didn't have time to stop. I want to see where. where, where, Wait wait a minute. Take it easy. There he is. In the cage there. Huh? It's a bird. A talking bird. Speak up, Buster. Come on, speak to the old-timer. <laughs> Listen to that, McGee. You hear him speak? Sure. Couldn't understand a word he said, kids. Foreigner, ain't he? Yeah, he can't understand you, too, either. Well, like I was saying to Bessie just yesterday, I Oh, said... how is Bessie these days, anyway? We haven't seen her in ages. Oh, Bessie's just fine, daughter. Cuter than a basket of kittens and just about as hungry all the time. <laughs> you two still going together, are you? Yep. 
He went to one of them radio queer shows last night, kids. Had a fascinating evening. Really? Had a fellow on the stage there with a microphone, a big voice, and a smile that looked like somebody opened the door on a china closet. <laughs> I know the guy you mean. Called me and Bessie up on the stage, and Bessie answered two questions right in a row. Well. One first prize. Wonderful. What were the questions? First he asked her her name, then he asked her my name. Bessie got the answers backwards, but they give her the prize anyhow. <laughs> A free trip for one with all expenses paid to Sydney, Australia. My goodness, that's quite a prize. When is she going? Not till she figures out some way to win a trip back, daughter. <laughs> so long, kid. So long, old time. There's more fun with the McGee's shortly. Most of us have been called away from home and loved ones at one time or another. And we know from the experience that there is nothing quite as important during those days of separation as mail. A good old letter from home. Any man or woman in the armed forces will tell you the only call that takes precedence over mess is mail call. And when a letter is more important to a hungry G.I. than food, you know it means something. The truce in Korea doesn't mean we should stop writing letters to our men and women in service, whether in U.S. camps or overseas. Mail from home is just as important now as it ever was. Yes, in some respects, it's even more important. The action, the strain, the anxieties of war can keep a soldier's mind occupied. But when the letdown comes, the time to relax, that's when morale needs a shot in the arm. Your soldier knows the shooting is over. He's done his big job, and now he wants to get home. But unfortunately, there's still a lot to keep him for a while. So don't let him down. Help keep up his morale. Write that letter today. What on earth are you doing with all that junk, McGee? This junk, my dear, is my old scrapbooks I brought down out of the attic. I'm looking up my past to give Willoughby some build-up material. You know, to give me a build-up with when he introduces me to speak tomorrow. Oh, that. Mm Mm-hmm. Are you supposed to take it to him, or what? No, his secretary's coming over to pick it up this afternoon. So far, I haven't found quite the right kind of material yet. I got to impress them executives some way, you know. Here, let's... Let's look at my newspaper clippings. Oh, Oh, here's a nice picture here. Hmm? From the Peoria Star. 1909. Says McGee boy gets head stuck in churn. Hmm. Shows your sister Kitty greasing your head. (laughs) <laughs> Can't see your face, though. No, no, that stuff won't help. I got a box of things here to show him, though. What's that? My medals. Medals? Mm-hmm. From the First World War. Here's my good conduct ribbon. It's a little tore from the time I got into that fight with those two lieutenants. What two lieutenants? The ones who said I didn't deserve a good conduct medal. Oh. <laughs> What's this? Ah, that's my old bayonet. Look out, kiddo, it's still pretty sharp. You know this thing once saved my life? Heavenly day. Yep. I was on leave in Paris when three ruffians cornered me in an alley. Luckily, I had this toadster with me. I raised it over my head and yelled, Come one step further and somebody's going to get hurt. Was anybody hurt? Yep. Me. Took a big nick out of my ear. That's why I say, look out, it's still pretty sharp. I think I better put it away. Where do you keep that thing? Right here in this box next to the iodine. That's something Willoughby can talk about when he introduces me. My war record. Yes. Introducing our guest speaker, Mr. Fibber McGee. Who in the First World War distinguished himself by cutting a hunk out of his ear with his own bayonet in an alley in Paris and... No, McGee. I guess not. Well, let me see. Here's my high school annual. Must be something in there that... Hey, I know. My chemistry class. I got an award in chemistry, you know. I didn't know that. Oh, I was always messing around with chemicals, Molly. My graduating class voted me the boy most likely to explode. <laughs> Willoughby might like to... No, I guess not. Why doesn't he just say, uh, and now, Mr. Fibber McGee, and sit down and let you have it? Oh, you can't do that, Molly. At a snazzy luncheon like this, those big shots want to know who they're listening to. Who is this guy, McGee? Is he an ex-ambassador, a big financier, or what? you got to be important to make a speech to a gang of... Oh, my gosh. If this is Willoughby's secretary, come to get the dope on me. Now, no, what do I no, do? What do I... no. It's just Dr. Gamble. Mm. Come in. 
Hello, Molly. Hiya, sonny boy. Afternoon, Doctor. Hi, Doc. I thought you were old man Willoughby's secretary till I caught the gleam of that blue serge suit that'd like to put my eye out. Willoughby's secretary? He's coming over to pick up some biography on himself here, so Mr. Willoughby will know how to introduce him tomorrow. So you're still going through with that mad scheme to expose your illiteracy at the executive's club tomorrow, are you? What does that mean? Just that, Sonny. See, now, he does have a pretty good speech, Doctor, if he can just read his own typing. I'll retype it. What's the speech about? I call it, The Little Man Looks at Big Business. Isn't that good, Doctor? Hmm, that is good. And I don't know a little a man to look at it. Biggest problem now is to figure out how Mr. Willoughby can introduce him. McGee seems to think he has to have some fascinating background of some sort. Oh, my gosh, I'll bet this is her. No, I'll take it. I'll tell her I invented the cotton gin. Tell her I discovered Billy Martin. I'll tell her that I'm the... Hush, hush, dearie. Come in. Good afternoon, McGee's resident. Yes, you're Miss... uh... Callahan, madam. I'm secretary to Jason J. Willoughby. Why, hello, Dr. Gamble. Hello, Doris. Let me do the honors. Molly, this is Miss Callahan. Doris, Mrs. McGee. How do you do, I'm sure. And this is the, uh... Gentlemen, you came to see, Doris, <clears throat> Mr. McGee. How do you do, sir? Charmed, miss. Charmed. I can give you all the information Jason needs on this lad, Doris. Oh, good. You stay out of this, that's all. I'll McGee, take. Uh, you see, miss... Uh, yeah, my... you want to know all about my college degrees, sis, uh, uh, miss. Uh, tell Willoughby that the Sorbonne in Paris... Saw you see, the... Doris, I... Right down, Doc. McGee, I think the doctor wants to speak. Thank you, my dear. Doris, you tell Willoughby that Mr. McGee doesn't want to be introduced as a great scholar. That's for sure. I see. And he doesn't want Jason to make any reference to fortunes that Mr. McGee has made and lost. I don't. Nor does he want any discussion of honorary degrees, of diplomatic decorations, or of his experience as an explorer and adventurer. Oh, good, good. Yes. Yes, good. This is a modest man, my dear. Ask Jason to introduce him tomorrow simply as a man of the people. A common man with a message. And they don't come any commoner, sis. Uh, miss, you may tell Jason that I wish to be thought of simply as an average American. Yes, sir. When I appear before this little gathering tomorrow, it will be as a man who speaks for the people of the people. Bye. We'll say goodnight to Fibber and Molly in a moment. More great comedy entertainment is yours for the listening tomorrow night when the NBC Radio Network presents the Bob Hope Show and the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show. Everyone knows Bob Hope's wisecracking rapid-fire style of humor, the stock and trade which elevated Bob to the heights of the comedy kingdom. You'll enjoy his program tomorrow night with the music of Les Brown's Band of Renown, the song stylings of Margaret Whiting and Bob's special guest stars. Later, on the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show, listen to another fast-paced comedy as Phil mixes with Elliot Lewis, Julius Abruzio, and Brother William to come out low man on the totem pole. Of course, there'll be songs by Phil and Alice to add to your listening pleasure and to top off the comedy carryings on. Also on Friday evening, listen to young and popular Eddie Fisher with his quarter hour of pleasure-filled song stylings and to the Dinah Shore Show featuring this glamorous songbird and the program of your favorite music. Friday and every day, you'll hear America's greatest radio programs on this station of the NBC Radio Network. Well, gee, Doc, thanks a lot for all the nice things you said about me. Yes, it was really nice. How'd you ever think of all that, Doctor? I don't know. Sometimes I scare myself. Stick around, Doc. Stay for dinner, huh? Yes, do, Doctor. No, thank you, Molly. I've got to get home. I want to wash my mouth out with soap. Good night. Good night. Good night, all. NBC has brought to you the Fibber McGee and Molly program, transcribed with Bill Thompson as the old-timer, Arthur Q. Bryan as Dr. Gamble, and Marion Richmond as Miss Callahan. This is John Wald inviting you to be with us again tomorrow night for another visit with Fibber McGee and Molly. Just for laughs, hear Can You Top This tonight on the NBC Radio Network.